I will be the chair of uh, this panel and I will use very sparingly this role. So our first uh, speaker is Viktor Petrov who will tell us a lot of interesting things about the development of computer in Bulgaria. Thank you. Um, yeah, so my paper, I'm a boring historian, so I don't, you know, sci -fi, the sci-fi bit of my paper is, um, comes after a lot of archives and boring, boring stuff about robots and computers, but at least I hope uh, I want to show, show you why this particular ideology of robotics and computerization arose in Bulgaria, uh, and how uh, socialism sought to achieve utopia through cybernetics and automation. Uh, and how this created a lot of hopes and anxieties, not only for the politicians, but for a variety of people throughout Bulgaria. And here I'm drawing upon the work of um, a historian of science called Peter Gallison, who talks about trading zones. He's a historian of physics, but there's different areas of science, including computing, where, which create a common language to trade knowledge and hopes and anxieties. And in the Bulgarian case, there was definitely something in the air and we had a common language between everyone from the Politburo, through the technical and social intelligentsia, and down to the science fiction writers we'll talk about. And the science fiction doesn't come in just with the two books I'll be talking about, but also um, it's part of a society that was, in fact, trying to build science fiction in some way, because computers and robots became from the 70s onwards uh, the definition of Bulgarian socialism, which was kind of emptying out of Marxist, quote, Marxist language and started the, the talking about scientific technical revolution as the one, the mobilizing language. So, turn this on. Yeah, I'll give you a very quick overview about this because probably most people don't know about Bulgarian computing. So, Bulgaria became the biggest uh, producer of computers in the Eastern Bloc in the, from the 60s onwards, uh, producing by the 80s up to 45% of all computing devices in the Eastern Bloc. Uh, the variety, there's a variety of reasons for this, which are beyond the scope of this paper. You know, stealing, uh, licenses, uh, <laughs> Comic-Con specializations, but stealing again. Um, so, <laughs> but it's, it, the result was an impressive number of computers being made, and especially the very banal disks and floppy drives, but actually that's the most, that's the best thing that the Bulgarians did. They realized that, you know, when, when hard drives are only like seven megabytes, you have to create a lot of them, especially for centralized economies which are storing and creating info the whole time. Uh, and the industry was, uh, had a huge human impact as well. Uh, it employed 215,000 workers in a country of 8 million. That's 13.5% of the industrial workforce. This is much bigger numbers than you might see in the USA or Singapore, rather, of the Asian tigers who also produced electronics. Um, this is the biggest electronic factory in the Eastern Bloc, in Stara Zagora, which uh, by the 90s was only producing hair dryers, sadly. But that's the story of the industrialization in the Communist Bloc, I think. And these are the kind of machines that were being produced throughout throughout the block, including Bulgaria, and we saw some of the machines also at the exhibit, because I think this is one of the reasons why it's not so surprising that the Bulgarians managed to create hundreds of space probes and space uh, <laughs> devices. It's precisely because there was a critical force behind this. Uh, the biggest scientific institute in Bulgaria by far was a computing institute. 4,000 scientific workers worked in that, including another 1,300 in the Cybernetics Institute. Uh, to compare the Cybernetics Institute in Kiev, the Soviet one, the biggest Soviet one, had 3,000 scientific workers in a country which is, of course, immeasurably bigger. Um, so, what did the party want to do with this? The party wanted to do a lot of things with this, mostly to make cash at the beginning, of course. Uh, computing was a golden goose in a country which was supposed to be an agricultural producer. Uh, and after Bulgaria had a massive debt crisis in the early 50s, one free throughout the socialist bloc, throughout the socialist period, he decided to look for a, for a low cost but high prestige and high profit good, one which could be created in a country with low natural resources. Uh, so, as the Bulgarian computing industry took off, by 1969, the party commissioned part of its central committee to decide what to do with this uh, beyond, beyond selling. Uh, the father of the Bulgarian electronic industry, a very well connected and very intelligent and very shrewd in electri electrical engineer called Ivan Popov, who was also a Politburo member, uh, in 1969 managed to uh, pass this decision 412 on cybernetics, um, where we, the party started talking about the economy and society is an interlinked organism made up of cells from the worker through the workplace all the way to the party itself 
where models and prognosis will allow for the perfection of social processes in human behavior. And this is the kind of operative language that moves from the 60s all down to the 80s, even as the polygraph changes, even as the party goes through its countless plenums. Uh, cybernetics became the operative language of achieving socialism. This was, of course, not a Bulgarian thing only. You know, in 1961, Khrushchev introduced cybernetics in the 22nd Congress, but I don't, uh, reading things from the Soviet party archives and reading things from the Bulgarian party archives, I didn't do a statistical analysis, but it's as if the Bulgarians in a mad rush to gloss over the failures of Marxism, they just seem to replace everything with cybernetization, electronization, robotization as the way to do things. So they, the concrete things that they tried to do was create um, automated systems of governance to, include, to automate any kind of production they could. This is one from a documentary film about automating copper production in a mine, uh, which the author very uh, kindly gave to me. It, it's set to like really nice electronic music and it's very hopeful. It didn't work. Um, uh, well, it didn't work very well at the very least. Um, and also they tried to create what I would call the Bulgarian internet from the 70s, the Kesi network which was to link computer centers from anything from ministries and factories down to collective farms in order to be able to automatically and, and accurately uh, collect all the information about economic production and uh, economic targets. Uh, and this is, of course, a thing that's happened in the Soviet Union with all gas as well. It was a huge project which was very interestingly written about by, in an award-winning book last year by Benjamin Peters, if anyone's interested, called How Not to Network a Nation. So this is a similar story, out of KESI and ESI, the United S Unified System of Social Information, still functions in Bulgaria. It's, it's part of the civil administration. It's where, how the EGNA was introduced into Bulgaria. That's a number that every Bulgarian citizen has. So it does have some concrete applications, but its roots were in this party directive of trying to automate in information processing in the country. Of course, the workspaces have to be automated too. And from the 1980s, Bulgaria became the biggest producer of robots, not just computers in the Eastern Bloc. And actually, per capita, it was the third biggest producer in the world. Again, the story involves a lot of stealing, a lot of licensing from the West Germans and the Japanese, uh, but th there were very concrete results. Um, computer centers, uh, such as the territorial computer centers, were introduced in every single major city in Bulgaria. This one is from Pleven, from the mid-70s, to collect, to be the first node of that big network, where, which would collect the information from the local factories and then like, pass it on to Sofia. Well, Robots started appearing in different workplaces. This is a welding robot, and this is a painting robot, uh, and these also are exported throughout the world. Um, and really, the party at this point talks about robotization, and it becomes much more clear what they mean by this. They want to eliminate what they call the subjective factor, which means the human factor, the workers. Because obviously, much the Bulgarian economy is not different to the Soviet economy in that way, or even or any of the other really socialist economies. The quality of production was always one of the biggest problems, and the party always thought how to, you know, how to change that. And they decided that the problem is not in the social and economic model that they have. It's the problem is in workers being slack, stealing, pilfering, sleeping on the job. So what's better is to have a robot. So. The people who had to make the robots started thinking about what they were actually doing, of course. And this is where I move into the technical intelligentsia who were, by the 70s, also philosophers in many ways. And so I concentrate on the Institute of Technical Cybernetics and Robotics in Sofia, led by Nikolai Napotanov with his, I don't know, full Elvis do over there, uh, who was a very intelligent and very well-connected man. Uh, he had the good fortune of being having impeccable communist pedigree. His father was uh, a Soviet uh, agent introduced into Bulgaria in the 40s for submarine, killed by the Bul Bulgarian police during the during the Second World War. This is great pedigree. Uh, and but the guy was also extremely intelligent. He specialized in Stanford and Caltech. Uh, and became the head of this institute, and under, under his purview, it, it grew into the biggest force of you know, cybernetics in Bulgaria. So apart from, at the beginning, they were obviously concerned with you know, how to automate machines, but eventually, especially Napotano, started thinking about how to automate everything, because uh, this, this has philosophical implications. His interest was mostly in bionics and ergonomics, so he started wondering about what man actually is doing in this new age. Man is not 
for him, man was not acting on the environment anymore. The environment was, was going to be manipulated through machines. Man has to manipulate information. So he introduced things called like the information model, uh, where he tried to create you know, the best type of um, ways to organize an office or a display so the worker could get the best kind of information. Uh, but it, this wasn't good enough for him because in the 70s T6 he came to the conclusion that in the modern world a worker has way too much information. You know, a man, he compared it to a, a pilot in a fast-moving jet uh, where, you know, he has parts of a second to react to things like altitude, speed, etc. And so he has to have some kind of automatic help. And in our modern world, especially, you know, a worker could have way too much information about a chemical process. And this gets even worse if he's working in social governance. He will have so much information on age, uh, gender, makeup, the workforce, pensions, whatever, so that he wouldn't know what to do with it. So he created a, what he called a conalog, the contact analog indicator, a way to reduce information from quantity to quality, which of course is uh, a matter of what does he choose to display. This is part of that, that paper that he writes, which is where you should place the most important information because the vision of the operator is obviously limited, so the least important information should be in his periphery. And uh, These kind of like man-machine interfaces have a philosophical implication for him, but also he kind of concedes that, you know, this man recedes further and further because he, man has receded from uh, acting on in the environment to acting on information to now acting on limited information, so he's becoming less and less autonomous in many ways. So, some of these people started writing in philosophy journals. Uh, the Philosophical Missile, the biggest Bulgarian philosophy journal from 45. Uh, Nikolai Stanulov was an example. He was one of the biggest cybernetics experts in the in institute in the 60s. His dissertation was automating tractors. By 1976, he's publishing things like this, a social governance model, where he sees society as a cybernetic organism, a machine, where people are active in changing and being changed, and the social consciousness of humans which act for the state and the dictatorship of the proletariat to create the social being, and this, how you feel during the social being, which is how you live in society, will feed back into your consciousness, etc., 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 and this will perfect humanity, which is, you know, a far cry from tractors. Um, but it's, it's, it's indicative of the kind of debates that we're starting to meld between technicians and technical intellectuals and philosophers and many people well waded in. And this was obviously helped by the late 70s and early 80s uh, reign of Ludmila Zhivkova in Bulgaria who in short was uh, also the, co the culture minister and was also looking for uh, a way to create a new renaissance man uh, for beauty and aesthetics and creativity. So technical intellectuals had a lot to say about how to be creative in this new world. Um, so for example Viktor Stoichev uh, a philosopher, but who talked about cybernetics a lot, talked about the new man being a Salieri rather than Mozart. Um, Mozart was a freak of nature. Uh, Mozart was maybe the greatest musician, but you, if you're sitting around waiting to be Mozart, you have to wait for a billion years to be reborn many, many times. The achievable perfection of man is Salieri. Salieri managed to approach Mozart and rival him by breaking down music into its component parts, you know, harmony, counterpart, etc. And he mastered the, each and every bit by selecting the right information and, and uh, selecting the right information and really, you know, repeating things much like a machine would. And so if in the future a laboratory for musical perfection has to be made, it has to be created called the Salieri Laboratory, not the Mozart Laboratory. And this kind of philosophy really permeates the pages and, and eventually leads to anxieties which, they, which are connected to the introduction of computing, not just to the workplace, but to schools. From 1984, Bulgarian schools uh, had computer classes. From 1984, Bulgaria had a system of computer clubs. A computer magazine called Computer for You, which the back cover we saw on the first page, and the first uh, with the robot playing the keyboard. So this anxiety about what's going to happen in this new world, where man is going to act more and more like machine, appears in these pages where psychologists talk about uh, either work being um, super stressful actually because of computing and robot robots because there's anxieties of lo job loss or strain while on the other hand these children will fall in love with the computer and fall into these dream spaces where where they'll be con disconnected from reality which in many ways it happens in Bulgaria because from the late 80s Bulgaria is also the virus production capital of the world for computer viruses but well, that's a whole different story 
Uh, so now I'll come to the science fiction bits. So these anxieties and hopes were, you know, were present in the fact that also Bulgaria is definitely, if per capita were the third biggest producers of robots in the world, if per capita of production of robotic laws, I don't think you can beat a country of 8 million people. Uh, there's 4 and 5, the 4th and 5th, and then there's actually 96 more satirical ones. Um, so the Luban Dilov, who we've heard about, wrote, writes in 1974 this, The Road of Icarus, a book which introduces the fourth law. It's a book um, which you know, summarizes it. Uh, Icarus is a hollowed out meteorite, which is a generation ship sent out to explore space, and it's fulfilled with the best and brightest of Earth, the best technicians, philosophers, etc. Um, and Zenon Belov is the main character. He's the first star citizen. He's the first person born in this new society who's also doing a PhD in robotics and he's really not interested in it. Uh, and there's a variety of stories inside, there's a variety of sub stories, but the, the, the novel really is preoccupied with both social and technological anxiety. The social anxiety comes from the fact that this is actually a very stagnating culture and stagnating society. Uh, there's a point, for example, where uh, um, the society has to decide what to do with a technician who has created a little child cyborg, which is against the laws of Icarus. The child cyborg also has the, the same brain waves as the brain patterns as the person who made them, so it seems like an attempt at cloning. So the cyborg is killed and they have to decide what to do with the, with the guy, put him on ice, Basically, at the same time, there's another debate about whether they should allow people to um, go out into the universe on, in spaceships rather than just sending automatic probes. So it's about stagnation. It's about the fact that these experts are very good at keeping a society running, but they seem to be really against innovation in any way, which is something that's taken up in the debate in the society by Zenon's father. And this is combined with technological anxiety, which drives Dilov to create the fourth law, that the robot must legitimate itself as a robot because robots are, are over in society, uh, often, taking the, often taking the shape of insects and, and animals. They're with Icarians from their childhood, and uh, Xenon muses that actually a robot must legitimate itself as a robot, because humans uh, are otherwise will not be able to make any distinctions between each other, because we're surrounded by them in this new society, and man will never allow uh, a robot to be his equal because man is playing a game against nature, which is a losing game and a game which shouldn't be played. So for Dilov, there's a lot of, you know, he's not. I, I don't feel that my reading of the book doesn't seem to suggest that he's very hopeful about the party's, uh, the party's dreams, and that comes across also in his short story collection, The Mischance Stories from My Computer, which is uh, a very kind of funny and bittersweet collection with where Dilworth himself is the character who inputs story ideas into his computer, which it then spits out the actual story, like he says, like pop fiction or horror or a love story. And then, and then the final one is a story about himself, where he's a character and the Strugatsky brothers are there. And he becomes crazy, but he eventually realizes the computer will never be able to produce anything because it's really mimicking his own stories. But there's a, the fifth law of robotics is written by a guy who is a bit more hopeful and optimistic. Uh, Nikola Kasarovsky is a trained mathematician. Uh, he was actually working within the electronic industry, so he's, a, he's this perfect meld of someone who is, maybe connects all the strands of the story together. Uh, and he himself also wrote in that Computer Free magazine, wrote stories for children or essays for children to popularize science. Uh, and in 1980, 1980 he, the, this was celebrated in a comic book in Taga, Rainbow. The Fifth Law of Robotics, and in 1983 it was put together with two other short stories into his little novella, The Fifth Law, which is on the left. So inside that story, um, inside the novella, there's the first story is interesting as well, not just the Fifth Law one. The first story is called The Crimson Drop of Blood, uh, in which a scientist is looking for alien life, and he starts getting messages from an alien life, and he's like wondering, where the hell is this, and who the hell is in, because he's getting it in his lab in his home in Sofia. And he realizes that actually the messages are from his blood cells. And the alien life is a society which is his blood, and he himself is a type of robot. And the society he's been trying to describe, that they've been trying to describe to him, is his own body. So it's this story where it's cybernetic machines all the way up and down. It's just like turtles all the way up and down. You yourself are a robot, which actually then puts the, fifth, the third story, the fifth law, which states a robot must know it is a robot into a different perspective, because it could be what he's saying is a man must know it's a robot. 
Uh, in that story, uh, it's set in South, it starts in South, uh, South Dakota in a restaurant where a very famous writer gets killed by a simple hug by a fan. Uh, and everyone's baffled until the police discover that the fan is a robot. And he didn't know he was a robot and he didn't know he had superhuman strength. The story kind of progresses in a somewhat Terminator-like manner with, you know, corporations and cyborg weapons and the fact that he was created as a weapon, etc., etc. Uh, and ends with, um, on a hopeful note, after, strangely, I think, after the robots have an inevitable uprising and they take over a weapons facility in Guam and threaten humanity with its own weapons. And as the helicopter is the helicopter is carrying the two best robot psychologists, one Bulgarian and one American, to, to Guam, and they have a conversation in the helicopter what's going to happen, and the more optimistic ones recalls Christ's word to St. Peter that, you know, he will betray him three times, but on that stone where he betrays him, he built his church. So I think for Kasserowski, there's definitely a vision that if a man accepts his own robotic nature in some way, that he's a machine in some nature, there is hope for him. Uh, very, very, very briefly, because uh, 20 minutes have just passed, Lubernikov satirizes this in 1989 with his 101st Law of Robotics. It's a very short story where uh, a writer who is writing the 100th Law of Robotics, uh, which states that a robot must never fall from a roof, uh, uh, gets killed by his own robot, who doesn't want to learn any more robotic laws. So the 101st Law of Robotics states that any author who tries to teach a simple-minded robot any new law should be beaten around the head with 200 volumes of Asimov's works. Which I think is a good place to end this paper about a, a society which wanted to replace humans with robots because humans were just not very good workers, but this is where it culminates. <laughs> Thank you so much. And now Victoria Kohn will take us to China. So I'm Virginia. Virginia. Oh, Virginia. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And as you can see, we're going to move geographically to a very different place than we've been up until this point. So the communist literature being produced in China is in some ways very similar to what we've seen in the conference so far with this Eastern Bloc literature, but in other ways is very different. And I'm going to be focusing very specifically on a type of propagandistic ephemera that was being produced primarily during the 70s, um, which if you're familiar at all with Chinese history, is the Cultural Revolution. and was discontinued more or less in the early 90s. So you can't find these being produced anymore, but there still are archives and repositories here and there. All right. Oh, I turned it off. So in 1949, the same year that the People's Republic of China was officially founded, the term science fiction began to be replaced by the term science fantasy fiction in line with Soviet usage. Following the victory of the Chinese Communist Party in mainland China, the People's Republic of China was guided by a Maoist ideology that, at least initially, drew much of its ideological legitimacy from a Sino-Soviet strategic partnership that laid out precise and explicit ideological guidelines for genre forms. Commentators such as Wu Yan and Rudolf Wagner have noted that, as a result, Chinese science fiction was thus allocated a specific place and role in socialist literary order, an order demarcated by strict rules and regulations. Speaking at the Yan'an Forum on Literature and Art, Mao Zedong himself called for a literary praxis that would ensure that revolutionary literature and art follow the correct path of development and provide better help to other revolutionary work in facilitating the overthrow of our national enemy and the accomplishment of the task of national liberation. Such a praxis of literature in general and science fiction in particular was reified in two ways. So first of all, it was required to describe a future communist society that was free from class struggle and committed to the reconciliation of humanity and nature. And secondly, in describing what would otherwise, otherwise be classified as bourgeois flights of imagination, the process must be described as those of a scientific mind accomplished through realistic techno-scientific development. So 
you really don't see a whole lot of aliens or spaceships in Chinese communist literature. Mao elaborated on his second point by emphasizing, and this is a quote again, that we are Marxists, and Marxism teaches that in our approach to a problem, we should start from objective facts, not from abstract definitions, and that we should derive our guiding principles, policies, and measures from an analysis of these facts. We should do the same in our present discussion of literary and artistic work. So many, if not most, literary historians, historians and sinologists therefore consider the Mao years to be essentially a blank spot in the literary landscape. The texts being produced under the aegis of Mao's rhetoric are often largely considered nothing more than empty propaganda with no redeeming literary merit. While it's inarguable that the form of literature in general and science fiction in particular changed during these years, I would argue that the shift in emphasis represented only a more extreme version of the nation building project that had already been underway at the fall of the Qing Dynasty and the early years of the 20th century. If you're not familiar with that, we won't go into it, but there's a lot of information out there for you. Science fiction being produced during that time was already caught in the double bind of attempting to collectively modernize the country using foreign literary and technological models while also creating a national identity. While science fiction being produced during the Mao years was distinct from that only insofar as it was more strictly regulated. So, while Maoist strictures regulated the flights of fancy that could be taken in pursuit of a communist national future, they produced an equally interesting mode of narrative utopianism that Nathaniel Isaacson has identified elsewhere as a quotidian utopia. The quotidian utopia was a mass-produced vision of a utopian future brought about through decidedly non-fantastical means and promulgated to the public as an explicit part of Mao's modernization strategy. It's perhaps best understood here as a mode of implied development rather than a narrative centered around an advanced technological system. So examples might include enticing volunteers towards public works in order to create a national railway system, or the development of new agricultural techniques to ensure a post-scarcity future, or achieving the dream of physical and moral hygiene through a hand-washing campaign. So what I'm pointing out here is that these were science fictional, but they brought about this fiction through extremely pragmatic, immediate junctures of how to achieve this. These are kind of humorous examples that I've put up here, but they're real examples from actual, actual items that I've read of this. So what that is is a utopian future for the nation was not described, nor was it presented to the public as science fiction as such. So these were not published as science fiction. But they retained their eye for future progress through these very quotidian means. What's important to note here is twofold. One, as I just mentioned, the shift away from science fiction as such to science fiction as a predictive mode, utilizing realist narrative and unremarkable technologies. And two, the fact that such literatures have not historically been recognized as belonging to the strictly defined genre of science fiction because their setting is firmly in the present. It's not even a year or two in the future. It's what you can do right now at the moment of reading. Yet, I would argue that they're no less science fictional simply because their future utopian dreams now seem to us to be rather commonplace for having largely been achieved. On the contrary, their use of innovative technologies to bring about a scientifically advanced modern society and their wide dissemination to the people renders this brand of quotidian utopian fiction an unparalleled attempt to bring the masses to the future through literary means. The fact that much of this literature and writing is dismissed as propaganda or not treated as worthy of academic investigation is an oversight very similar to the dismissal in the Western canon of science fiction itself as an inconsequential genre literature. 
While it may very well be true that few great, however you want to define that, works of science fiction were produced during the Mao years, the shift in emphasis to the utilization of mass technologies is symptomatic of a still extant utopian drive in literature that, despite increased state crackdowns on the freedoms afforded authors and the broad social denigration of non-realist imaginaries condemned as bourgeois, the science fictional imaginary continued to produce. So this is the focus of my paper now, is we're bringing it to an often ignored but valuable example of the mass production of quotidian literature, which are the serialized booklets known as Lian Huanghua, or linked serial pictures. A very loose translation of this might be comics, but we don't have an equivalent in the West of what these are. Um, I've talked to some of you outside the conference about this, so forgive me if you've heard it, but you know how when you go to the doctor and they give you these illustrated pamphlets for the steps you take to cover your mouth or to put on a condom or to, yeah, brush your teeth, things like that. And they're illustrated. These were like that, but a hundred pages long. So the illustration is what's important. There is text associated with it, but they weren't required to be focused on the text because at that point in time, most of Chinese society was illiterate completely, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So, as I've just told you, these were small booklets, usually between 50 to 100 pages. About three-fourths of each page was taken up by an illustration. The bottom fourth or so was dedicated to explicative text. So. They were widely published in mainland China beginning in the 1920s, but they reached their peak in the 60s and 70s following the Cultural Revolution. They were largely promulgated as a way to bring information to the illiterate masses. The Lian Huanghua were used as a tool of education and propaganda in the state's move towards modernization. And as a result, there are innumerable examples of the impact of trains, mining, agricultural improvements, electricity, telephone lines, shipping techniques, you name it, on the development of the country, as well as their impact on individual lives. By combining public health and public works propaganda with narrative and images, the Lian Huanghua were used as pedagogical tools for children, peasants, and the illiterate. And as such, the narratives being produced are idealized in the extreme. These are extremely utopian narratives that, are, that we're seeing here. This does not detract from their value as, cult, as historical artifacts, however, and indicates the way that the publishers sought to establish and shape mass opinion of the nation building process. What's more, Despite popular misconceptions, Lian Huanghua were never exclusively intended as youth literature, though they were indeed very popular with younger readers. Their sequential illustrations were also popular with readers possessing low levels of literacy. A broadly defined umbrella group, particularly targeted by the Communist Party leadership during the Cultural Revolution, as a means of bringing the utopian drive towards modernity to the country's peasants and illiterate masses upon whose shoulders the process of nation building was born. It's been estimated that as much as 85 to 90 percent of China's total population was illiterate by the time the Communist Party seized power in 1949. So as late as 1949, up to 90 percent of the population couldn't read. Uh, after which, through these mass literacy campaigns, they reduced that rate to 15% by 1990 and 6% by the turn of the 21st century. So these mass literacy campaigns almost entirely wiped illiteracy off the map. It's incredible how quickly this change came about. As a meta-narrative of the national drive towards utopia, I'm going to show you a few, I think. I'm not going to read these. These translations are my own, so if there's problems, come at me afterwards. Um, and I'm not going to go into the ones that I'm showing up here specifically. They're just examples um, of the kinds of things you could see. So 
As a meta-narrative of the national drive towards utopia, the Lian Huanghua not only contained explicit instructions for both individual and collective improvement, they were a tool of that improvement. They served the dual purpose of disseminating utopian praxis while also being an extension of that same quotidian development. As part of the Communist Party's mass literacy campaign, they were used as pedagogical tools in and outside the classroom, shaping a future for the country through a process that enrolled even those traditionally excluded from a nation built by and for the educated class. Theoretically, even those incapable of becoming literate through the process of reading Lian Huanghua could still receive edification from and contribute to the vision of the future promoted by these materials and their illustrations. Yet, even given all that, a close reading of these materials reveals the potential for ideological discrepancies between graphical theory and praxis. What, if anything, I'm asking here, was lost in the interplay between illustrations and the words underneath? Was the experience of pedagogical instruction perceived uniformly between literate and illiterate readers? And what kind of epistemological gap opened up in the space between images and words? Borrowing from comic theory, Sean Carletto notes that at their core, comics offer readers the chance to actively construct, critically interpret, and consciously reflect on and relate to specific messages. Unlike popular mediums such as film and television, comics require more from their readers to establish basic meaning. And while I do think that this is important to an analysis of this, I also want to remind you all that these are not comics in the same sense as we often think of them. While readers, and they're not always going to be readers, of Lian Huanghua may have possessed a certain degree of visual literacy in constructing a literal vision of the future, it's too simple to claim that it was entirely the readers of Lian Huanghua who constructed any meaning, given that oftentimes there was a deliberate disjunction between words and their accompanying images in order to hide or deliberately mislead in terms of sensitive political content. And much of that would have been inaccessible knowledge to an illiterate readership. So I'll draw your attention here to this particular slide, which is from a Lian Huanghua called Little Soldier Chang Ka Zi, uh, which is a Lian Huanghua of about 200 pages. And five of them deal with the murder of Chinese civilians by the Japanese military, which, as you can imagine, was a very sensitive topic. Uh, as Chen Minjie notes in her translation, so this translation is not mine, I got this somewhere else. The image is of a young boy leaning against his grandmother. So the image is very tender, it's loving, familial. Uh, yet the text that the grandmother's conversation balloon says is, Last time the devils came, the devils are the Japanese, both your mom and dad were killed. This time when they sweep down here, who knows how many more will suffer. So someone who can't read obviously has no idea that this is what the grandmother is talking about. And in fact, later on, she too is brutally murdered. It happens off screen, so you don't see it. So this disjunction between text and image mirrors the teleological rupture of the communist revolution itself. In many ways, Mao's consolidation of power and reconceptualization and control of a nation-specific ideology that controlled not only literary production, but epistemological understanding of what was and was not scientific in accordance with political ideology, was the ultimate teleological rupture. While previous revolutionaries from the decades leading up to the Cultural Revolution had sought to modernize the country by incorporating an already existing socio-political structure, technologies that could change the structure itself, Maoist rhetoric was fundamentally apocalyptic. Earlier modernizers, including Liang Qichao and Lu Xun, who were pretty famous in Chinese history, believed in linear time and teleological progress. 
which was itself already largely a departure from earlier Confucian emphasis on cyclicality. Yet the Cultural Revolution fundamentally rejected the epistemological integration proffered by earlier science fiction and influenced by the West. This is a quote. Marked by the optimism that the present epoch is special and brand new and is a radical rupture with the past, this sense of history drew on a range of intellectual resources from social Darwinism, the Enlightenment notions of democracy, science, and progress to nationalism and Marxism." End quote. Recognizing that the West was understood to be at the leading edge of evolutionary time gave a geospatial location, and this goes back to the zones we talked about earlier, to a modernity that was fundamentally incompatible with Maoist attempts at national consolidation. Logically, if the vanguard of evolution and modernity was in the West, if science was the property of the West, and if civilization was the culmination of Western cultural and scientific achievements on a universal evolutionary scale, then science had to be an indispensable component of civilizational achievement. So it's no wonder then that fiction under the ideological purge of the Cultural Revolution could not foreground either the future, since that was associated with the West, or with technologies that had yet to be developed since it was trying to distance itself from this kind of Western notion of modernity. Nor could they draw from the past, as it too was associated with traditional degradation and stasis. Instead, literary modernity was, as David Derway Wong has noted, transformed from a teleological endpoint into an existential series of moments each disconnected from the past and unable to identify with the future. In this pro process, science fiction receded to the quotidian. Science fiction couldn't be anything other than the immediate, the here and now, a series of moments, one after the other, exchanging far-reaching visions for an emphasis on the here and now. So, in conclusion to this, Lian Huanghua offered a uniquely visual means of disseminating a national future-oriented vision couched in a language of historical socialist materialism that was intended to be accessible to all citizens of the newly communist state. That it was neither categorized as science fiction, as such, focusing as it did on explicitly quotidian practices of development, nor necessarily unproblematic in its execution of collective modernization and accessibility, does not remove it from consideration as a cultural literary artifact. Lost it. And I was on such a roll, too. Yeah, cultural literary artifact enrolled in the literal and literary process of nation building. It may be controversial to sinologists and scholars of revolutionary ephemera to categorize these texts as falling within the genre of science fiction, but in their vision of a future free from hunger, disease, suffering, and even inconvenience, which everyone reading them contemporarily had played a part in creating, or so they thought, they were instrumentalized in the communist meta-narrative that constructed itself. So thank you both Virginia and Victor for the interesting papers and for being so very precise in terms of timing. And uh, now uh, I believe this is the last paper for this panel but also um, the last panel for the conference before the discussion we're going to have after lunch. I give the floor to Katie Stone. Hi. Um, so, to briefly preface my remarks today with a small disclaimer, uh, when I was writing this paper, I did not realise I would be speaking directly before Professor Subin. Um, so, I think to try and discuss someone's writing when you're aware they are about to discuss it far more eloquently than you. Uh, particularly in a 20 minute paper, is a task doomed to at least some embarrassment. But I'm going to try and mitigate that slightly 
by not attempting to encompass Sugan's key theories, uh, which I'm sure many of you are very familiar with already. Um, instead, I'm going to keep this paper to my core argument, which is, in essence, a simple one. Um, it is that Marx's science fiction criticism, and I'll take Subin as a central example, but I'll also trace the tradition backwards into the work of utopian philosopher Ernst Bloch, and forwards into that of British novelist and critic China Mierville. Um, so Marxist science crit fiction criticism, I argue, is engaged with communism not merely as a branch of political and literary theory, but as a political reality. So essentially, while much Western academic Marxism is framed in almost exclusively theoretical terms, with actually existing socialism dismissed as an incidental or indeed often irrelevant phenomenon, which supposedly has no real connection to the pure Marxist thought, it's my contention that this is not true of Marxist science fiction criticism. Um, so in many ways, it's not that controversial of an idea. A lot of my analysis here is structured around the facts of these writers' respective publishing histories. Uh, so Ernst Bloch, for example, lived for many years in East Germany and has been called the semi-official philosopher of the DDR. Uh, Darke Suvin grew up in what was then the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia and has since written a history of the country entitled Splendor, Misery and Possibilities, an X-ray of Socialist Yugoslavia. So, um, and China Mievel published a book last year called October, which is a historical study of the 1917 Russian Revolution. Um, so, although Mievo has never lived in a communist or a former communist country, uh, none of these writers have made any secret of their interest in actually existing socialism, um, of communism as a political reality. Uh, so, one might then reasonably ask, like, why bring it up? Why make what seems a pretty obvious point about their biographies? Um, but my answer is that, in general, science fiction critics, are like, at least in the West, um, don't talk about this. There are a few science fiction critics who are as well known or as much discussed as Darko Subin. He's one of the founders of the Academic Journal Science Fiction Studies and his seminal work, Metamorphoses of Science Fiction, which was published in 1979, uh, has been unparalleled in influence. Uh, Jerry Canavan, in his introduction to the new edition of Metamorphoses, claims that science fiction criticism as a field is Subinian, or at least post Subinian. Um, and he refers to the publication of this book as the Suvin event. Um, and Mark Bold, who's Mierville's sometime collaborator, uh, has said that Metamorphoses itself arrived like a novum, reordering SF theory and criticism around it, idiosyncratically and contingently wedding SF to Marxism. Um, so my point is not to suggest that this emphasis upon Marxism as a branch of political and literary theory is unjustified, um, rather, I want to suggest that it's not Marxism in the abstract, as an easily transferable, a historical, theoretical model which Subin's influences has wedded to SF criticism, but rather Marxism as directly informed by actually existing state socialism. Um, one can see the pressure to abstract these Marxian principles, perhaps particularly in the figure of the Novum. Um, so, Bold's use of it here to stress Subin's significance to the genre is, I think, a good example of how distance the Novum has become from its original use in Bloch's philosophy, uh, which Suvin later linked to what he called the strange newness of SF. Um, so it's standard practice to ask like, what the Novum is in any given science fictional work, meaning like, what technology or social apparatus is new to us in this text, which is not by any means a pointless question, but it does demonstrate the degree of abstraction to which Bloch's ideas have been pushed. Um, so Bloch is a difficult, I think, and strange philosopher, um, but I'd argue that the principle of hope, of which the first two volumes were published in the DDR, is fundamentally connected with the idea of both hope and the novum as elements of the political realities of life. Um, now undoubtedly this includes cultural artifacts. Uh, Bloch includes fairground stools, operas, fairy tales in his analysis but always they are emanations of the political realities of the communist state, the new world, which that's what he calls it. He believed himself to be living in at that time. Um, so my purpose here is not to attempt to displace Marxist science fiction criticism. Um, I think this is a rich and significant field to which academic science fiction criticism in general is a great debt. Um, but what I want to do instead is to try and establish a connection 
or rather to acknowledge the existing connection between Marxist science fiction criticism and actually existing socialism and to investigate the reasons that this connection has been previously obscured. Um, one of these, I think, is Sue Vin's position within the formalist tradition um, in Russian literary criticism. So his most influential text, Metamorphoses, for example, sometimes refers to prevailing ideas of a certain time period or biographical details of the authors he's studying, um, but it rarely engages for lengthy periods with the contemporary social milieu in which either he or they exist. Similarly, although Bloch has produced historical studies, including Heritage of Our Times, which is like an analysis of early 20th century Germany and the rise of Nazism, uh, largely his philosophical works are written in an expressionist style, which is full of florid prose and surrealist imagery almost. Um, I think the critical overlooking of this connection with communism as a political reality goes deeper than this like, stylistic element. Um, there's something counterintuitive about reading science fiction in relation to political reality in this way. After all, science fiction is defined by being non-realist, by not being connected to reality and by taking us to another world. Um, to insist on the relevance of actually existing socialism to Marxist science fiction criticism is not, however, to take away from the strange newness of SF. It's an attempt to establish that that newness is not otherworldly, or that reality is strange, and that large-scale social upheaval is not merely theoretically possible, but has actually happened in a way which has always fascinated Marxist science fiction critics, I think. Um, so, as Yuvin puts it, speaking of his youth in socialist Yugoslavia, um, it became very easy to think of alternative time streams, of alternative histories, because we all lived them. Um, so, many people here over the past few days have explored the extent to which various communist states have given rise to the production of science fiction. Um, that, that isn't my goal here, and nor am I primarily a scholar of Eastern Bloc science fiction or someone with any lived experience of living under communism or in a formerly communist country. So, although I'd like to encourage further exploration of the effects of like, specific elements of the very different instances of actually existing state socialism <coughs> which these writers have studied and lived through, my analysis is solely concerned with how an understanding that for them Marxism is not really theoretical informs our understanding of their science fiction criticism. Um, so this begins with Sue Vin's famous definition of the genre, which Canavan has said now acts as a consensus starting point for SF critics. Uh, this definition is as follows, um, so I'm, I'm just going to read it all, that a science fiction text is a fictional tale determined by the hegemonic literary device of a locus and or dramatis personae that are radically or at least significantly different from the empirical times, places and characters of mimetic or naturalist fiction, but are nonetheless, to the extent that SF differs from other fantastic genres, um, simultaneously perceived as not impossible within the cognitive norms of the author's epoch. So, mostly the definition of this non-impossibility of science fiction, what Mievel's called the not yet possible, in an allusion to Bloch's theory of the not yet conscious, um, has been thought of in terms of the hard sciences. I mean, there are obvious exceptions to this, but I think the popular understanding of it is that. Um, so, Sivinian critics often give a lot of weight to the plausibility of the technological inventions in science fiction texts, um, despite Sivin listing gadgets as the minimum possible science fictional innovation. Um, in fact, I'd argue that given Sivin's explicit interest in soft science fiction, his preference for H.G. Wells over Jules Verne, for example, uh, the non-impossibility of science fiction should be thought of in relation to the social sciences. Uh, Metamorphoses was published at the start of a decade marked by the spread of neoliberalism across the West, and Sivin's American contemporaries were operating under the regime of Reaganomics, with Margaret Thatcher's insistence that there is no alternative to capitalism echoing across the Atlantic. Um, so for them, any kind of utopian science fiction displaying a strangely new society constructed using anti-capitalist principles was, I think, an exploration into impossibility. Um, and this is reflected in a big drop-off in depictions of utopias in science fiction in the 1980s, in, at least in Anglophone science fiction, and I'd be very interested to hear if that's different elsewhere in the world. But um, in the mid-1970s, which saw the publication of Ursula Le Guin's The Dispossessed, Joanna Russ's The Female Man, Marge Beatty's Woman on the Edge of Time, um, 
not how many lanes Triton and the uh, final alternative may have seemed like not yet possible to fit into this character of non impossibility. But by the 1980s, um, a socialist utopia, I think, was, was perceived in the realm of impossibility in the West. So the stuff of fantasy, not science fiction. Um, Stephen's controversial stance on fantasy, I think, must be saved for another time, although I'm happy to um, talk about it later if people want to. Um, but it must be noted that his perspective on science fiction and on the non-impossibility of communism is radically different from that of his contemporaries in the US. The fact that much of his writing has been published in English and he spent the majority of his working life in North America has led people to forget that he, to use Mark Bold's phrase, burst onto the scene from somewhere else. I think this is partly due to the fact that Suvin's most influential work, Metamorphoses, is divided neatly into two parts, a theoretical one and a historical one. Um, and he's noted in an interview that he doesn't defend the structure and would prefer to fuse the two together, um, which uh, you know, I, I agree with him. I think he's correct to be hesitant about it, um, essentially because it's allowed people to extract the theory without engaging with the history, and more broadly to extract theory from the study of science fiction in general. Um, so the effect of this extraction is effective distancing of theory from history, of science fiction from reality, so that the not yet possible becomes a question of the distinction between, for example, not as fast as light travel from faster than light travel, rather than the distinction between capitalism and communism, or like the relevant social structures. Um, many readers, I think, have got stuck on the fact that Su Vin wrote that only that which is unrealizable can be called utopia, as if it justified utterly impossible social structures in science fiction as long as the technology they used was true to life. Um, and again, Suvian's combination of formalism with an interest primarily in Victorian English science fiction does explain what I would argue is a misreading of this kind, but it doesn't theoretically justify it. Um, now, he states of utopia, but as he conceives of utopia as like proto-science fiction, um, and we're going to hear later about the connections between utopianism and the genre as a whole, I think what he has to say applies just as well to non-utopian science fiction, actually. Um, so he writes... One should insist on the crucial concept of a radically different location of an alternative formal framework functioning by explicit or implicit reference to the author's empirical environment. Uh, without this reference, non-utopian readers, having no yardstick for comparison, could not understand the alternative novelty. Conversely, without such a return of feedback into the reader's normality, there would be no function for utopias, or other strange genres. Um, and he quotes Bloch, who states that the real function of estrangement is and must be the provision of a shocking and distancing mirror above the all-too-familiar reality. Um, so I think the anxiety felt in science fiction criticism and taking this seriously, improperly accounting for the idea that estranged genres require a constant return of feedback to realism, is that they would thus become obsolete, you know, a kind of hyper-realism or non-naturalist subgenre rather than a significant literary presence in their own right. Um, however, I think that when Su Vin says that in the alternative time streams of the Yugoslavia of his youth, it was very clear what would happen if Hitler won the war, one didn't need to read Philip K. Dick to know it. He's not dispensing with a need for Dick's The Man in the High Castle. He's merely stressing that its non-impossibility was at that time obvious. Um, and this, I think, is the key point, that if one is aware of the possibilities of actually existing socialism, or indeed of the possibility of genuine like, revolutionary upheaval of any kind, science fiction appears far more closely tied to reality, but no less strange. Um, when Stephen speaks of discovering science fiction, he says, the possibility of catching a great number of wavelengths appealed to me very much, and I think that was the result of the historical epoch I lived through. So, for Stephen at least, this may be specific to his Yugoslavian experience, um, but actually existing socialism opened up the many wavelengths of science fiction by demonstrated that there are alternatives and his theory of the necessary non-impossibility of SF I think carries this inheritance with it. Um, so Ernst Bloch's story is in some way parallel to Suvin's uh, because he's associated with the Frankfurt School people tend to view him as existing in an earlier time and, and of Suvin's use of his philosophy as a kind of anachronistic salvaging um, from Marxist history. 
uh, certainly Bloch ac actively supports salvaging of this kind. And in fact, his interest in the utopian potential of the past, I think, is crucial to my argument about the proximity between the novum and historical reality in his writing. Um, however, in some ways, Bloch is also Suvin's contemporary. Both were living in socialist countries in the 1950s, and Bloch continued writing into old age. And death in 1977, just two years before the publication of Stephen's Metamorphoses. Um, so part, at least, of the overlap in their theoretical stances can be attributed to these essentially biographical similarities. Uh, Bloch was also an immigrant intellectual in America, although in this case he was fleeing Germany due to the rise of Nazism. Um, and he writes about the immigrant experience, stating, the German refugee writer brings his roots with him, a mature language, an old culture, he brings these values to America, and he remains faithful to them, not by making museum pieces out of them, but by testing and quickening his powers on the new stuff of life. So here again, the old and the new are inseparable, tied together at least. Uh, in Bloch's configuration, you can be faithful to your roots in historical reality, while still quickening your powers on the new stuff of life, or indeed of strangely new art. Um, this then is another correction to the popular usage of Bloch's novum in science fiction criticism, or maybe not a correction, but a reimagining, um, an attempt to push further using his ideas. Um, when contemporary science fiction critics use Bloch's ideas, then, and for this example, I'm going to use something Nieville said in an interview, because I, I want to be clear that Marx's science fiction criticism, as I'm tracing it through these writers, isn't homogenous or without disagreement and discontinuity. Um, and although Bloch, Suvin and Nieville are all engaged with actually existing socialism, uh, that doesn't mean that they might not also be complicit in the abstraction of Marxist theory, I think, in science fiction criticism. Um, so, to, to return, uh, when Nieville says that he cannot imagine the post-revolutionary communist future by definition, because he has a pre-revolutionary perspective, thus arguing for an absolute epistemological break, between political reality and strange newness, uh, he's drawing upon a Blockian notion of utopia, but he's doing so in a way which I would argue erases Bloch's belief in the utopian traces and latent utopianism um, within historical reality. Uh, so, in The Principle of Hope, Bloch states, the good new is never that completely new. And I think it's this partial novelty, which is no less strange, but significantly connected to reality, which I think is central to his philosophy as it applies to science fiction. Um, so for Bloch and Suvin, their concern with Marxism as it applies to political reality can be thought to precede their analysis of science fiction in Suvin's case and utopianism in Bloch's. However, for Mieville, the process, at least in his publication history, is reversed. Uh, his science fiction has always been engaged in revolutionary history. Uh, the new would-be king in his 1998 novel, King Rat, ends the novel by proclaiming himself citizen rat and declaring this is day one of the rat republic, while strikers and activists fill his Bas Lard trilogy, and in his science fiction novel, <coughs> Embassy Town, language itself revolts. Um, however, it was not until last year that he turned his attention specifically to the history of communism and his non-fictional work, October, um, which endeavours to tell the story of the 1917 Russian Revolution. Um, so in some ways, one might think this marks a transition in Nieville's thinking from a consideration of Marxism as a theoretical structure for his fiction to a historical interest in the realities of communist revolution. Um, and indeed, he does suggest that his interest in science fiction led to his ability to tell this historical story. Um, so as he puts it, uh, a knack for world building can translate to a knack for world observing. If you approach the world aesthetically and with a fantasticating eye, you develop an antennae for the lived fantasies of everyday life. Uh, however, just as Bloch's utopia is embedded in political history, and Suvin's appreciation of science fiction is fundamentally tied to the strangenesses of his socialist youth, theory and practice, fiction and history, are far more clo closely enmeshed in Mieville's thought than this neat model of transition would suggest. Um, there's a much more complicated feedback process involved in the relationship between his role as a science fiction author on the one hand and a historian on the other, his fantasticating eye does not, after all, transform the political reality he observes, 
rather it allows him to see the lived fantasies, as he calls them, which were always there. Um, Mievel doesn't feed the strangeness into the history of Zergs. Um, in interviews about the book, he has, uh, sorry, October, um, he's repeatedly noted that the revolution itself is stranger than fiction. That in his words, if I'd made it up as a piece of fiction, my editor would have told me to dial it back. Um, indeed, he's described saving details of the various religious sects which sprung up around the revolution, for example, to use in his later fiction. And when you read of the Kakani, of the Cossack troops who obeyed the letter of the law by blocking the streets with their horses, but due to their sympathy with the revolutionaries, in fact, stood so still that the marchers they were supposed to be obstructing, in fact, walked underneath the horses, you could easily think this was a work of science fiction. Um, as I've said, this paper doesn't aim to provide a um, historical overview of the various iterations of communism these theorists were exposed to. There are big and often uncomfortable questions to ask of, for example, block support of the Moscow show trials, or the effect that the spectre of Stalin, which is Mievel's phrase for it, has had on his account of the revolution, or perhaps should have had. Um, however, I feel that broadly what their insistence on the potential reality of the strangely new, the radically different, and the alternative to capitalism does, is to anchor the science fiction which they variously create and study in those strange realities. Um, to suggest that Marxism is primarily about literary theory for these writers is to abstract the science fiction which is their subject from its political ba base and to rob the realities of history of their many strangenesses. Thank you. And so we come to the end of uh, the papers from this panel and I open the discussion. So, um, great presentations, all of you. Uh, my question is specifically to Katie. Um, I really, really enjoyed your talk, and I think it's very important to trace back uh, all those people's takes on on the Slovenian event and everything that is that constitutes the field around it. Uh, I guess you touched upon that. Uh, but may maybe would you like to uh, elaborate a bit more on uh, that specific dialogue between Nieville and Suvin, so in Red Planets uh, and the afterwards Nieville uh, comments uh, on Suvin's take on fantasy, on the, on, on the Novum, and also there's Carl Friedman's uh, cognition effect reinterpretation of the Novum, which I guess feeds into that interpretation of the novum as an effect of alterity rather than something that comes just from science and observable facts. And I guess this ties with uh, the alternative realities that are possible and retrievable from history. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, Mieville is, is really a big a critic of Suvin and like, engages with Suvinian theory a lot in his, his critical writing. Um, and I think the main uh, thing that they bring up is this idea of the broader fantastic, is what Mievel calls it. So the idea that science fiction shouldn't be divorced from, Suvin often calls uh, it, like consolatory fantasy. He thinks fantasy is like essentially, um, uh, at least in metamorphoses, I think he has had changes of opinion, but um, he frames it as uh, always uh, about escapism and being essentially mystifying and not being about what he thinks cognitive estrangement should be about um, and uh, which he thinks the novum helps you to get at which is this this connection between I think a reality and fantasy and I think he does um, so Mieville's critique of it is that actually um, but the, he says that scientism, um, so like the trappings of science fiction as we understand it, so laboratories, space, aliens, like all of those things that we normally associate with genre of science fiction, um, are just like one way of expressing the, the novum and this kind of estrangement, um, and that they are like unnecessarily privileged in in Subin's, uh, early thought at least, um, because of their yeah reliance on the kind of um, uh, epistemological security, this idea that like, oh, if you're a scientist, that's like what's real. Um, and I think that Mievel has a has a much uh, broader understanding of what, uh, yeah, the, what the novum can mean and, and what estrangement can mean. Um, and yeah, I think that does tie into alterity. Is as you say, is like the key thing, and just 
um, being different and being new automatically ties into these like real strangenesses and social structures without having to say, well, how would you exactly do that? Like, what's the um, what's the logical steps? I think extrapolation. <laughs> Well, actually, I just would like to make, to make one more comment. I think as far as Suvin is concerned and his distinction between fantasy and science fiction, the only distinction which works, I think, up to now is the relation to the laws of physics. While in science fiction they observed, all other genres are violated to, to, for their own targets, like to escape from reality or to let the good uh, win over the, the evil and so on. So I think that still is valid, right? It's, I mean, I guess, uh, yeah, absolutely, I think there's a distinction to be made, like, between the modes, I think, like, it has to matter um, what, what kind of relation they have to the laws of physics, absolutely. I don't think that um, the association of, like, uh, non, I guess, this, this idea of non-impossible or non-yet-possible, like, wh where that line lies, and I don't think it's necessary that, that um, things that fall outside of science fiction and fall into the broader fantastic are necessarily about uh, good and evil. Like, I don't think that that's... Well, I, just uh, one of the examples of the targets, why the oh, laws yeah, of physics are violated, yeah. Absolutely. yeah. No, no, and that's... speaking about Atstranenia, yeah, as we were speaking also yesterday, so not all uh, Atstranenia is uh, related to the science fiction or to fantasy. Also fairy tales and things like that, so... Just, yeah, right. I have uh, two comments and a question. Uh, briefly with Katie, don't worry, the question is this thing is the role of young students to provoke theories. To uh, your topic, to, I'm sorry. To, to, I want to just give one comment from a long time friend and a sci fi enthusiast and a writer and a journalist, Peter Tabuf, who comments a little bit deals fourth law. What a police law! Because it has the, the, the notion of police and identification. And finally, actually, question to um, Virginia. Uh, we notice a lot of women uh, in the stations. We don't speak about gender. Those of us familiar with history of communism, we know there's some, some emancipation of women. Can you comment a little bit on the gender perspective on, your, on these stories? Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure what the situation is like in Eastern Bloc communism, but in Chinese communism, there was this move to erase gender. and take it out of the equation as any kind of factor. There's a saying in Chinese, women hold up half the sky. Um, so there was a complete erasure of femininity as a concept. So you often, s which is not to say that there was an erasure of female coded jobs. <laughs> like women were usually not building the railroads, but they were, entering the factories in unprecedented numbers. They were expected to take on the nation building process in a very real way, in a way that they had perhaps been denied earlier, or depending on how you value it, uh, protected from earlier. Um, so it's rare that you see in any communist literature from this time, either science fictional or otherwise, books or texts about women that foreground their femininity. Which is not to say gender is taken out of the equation, but it's treated differently. Um, the, the examples that I showed up here, none of the women and it should be said that the characters in this are really only there to get across the didactic element. There are narratives associated with it, but they're very flimsy, they're very flat. Uh, the narratives are not the main point for the most part. Uh, so the women who are in them are just there to fill a role. It doesn't matter mostly if it's a man or a woman doing it. Who was it this who was it that said that? I was saying this in the question. Okay. Journalist and uh publisher and uh, sci-fi fans and stuff. There was a question. 
last question. It's not the last, I think. There is another one, and I have questions as usual. My question is for Virginia. Uh, I was curious to know if these works were acknowledged as utopian at the time. I know very little about the Maoist context, but I was wondering if there was any kind of tension between Maoism and utopia the way there was in the Soviet context. Um, or was this just considered at the time to be pure realism, just set in the future? I was wondering if you could talk a little more about that. Actually, I want to, to um, um, add my question to this because it's, it's very close. How do we distinguish this type of, it's very interesting, this idea of quotidian, quotidian uh, utopia, but how do we distinguish it from the um, definition of social realism, which was predominant at the time and which ran as, uh, ran as follows, uh, uh, reflection of reality in its revolutionary transformation. For me, this would be the, the, this would be the perfect illustration of socialist realism if it ever happened anywhere in, in its perfect form. It seems to be happening here. Yeah, I can speak to that a little bit only because my classification of these materials as science fiction, I think, is something that may cause a little bit of pushback from the Sinophone community, because these were never intended to be science fiction. Um, they weren't published as science fiction, they weren't categorized in their dissemination as science fiction. Um, science fiction really wasn't big thing during the Cultural Revolution. Um, I'm categorizing them that way and they're, I got the term quotidian utopia from another scholar in the field, Nathaniel Isaacson. I didn't come up with that term, but I am viewing these as qualitatively different from social realism because they are actively imbricated in the process of creating a utopian future that has not yet arrived, but is predicated upon actions taken in the here and now. So this utopian future is assured if only people do what they need to do right now, which does not require any kind of future technology or even estrangement. And I think that may be one big difference between, potentially, that may be one difference between Eastern Bloc science fiction and Chinese science fiction, and certainly is a difference between Western science fiction and Chinese science fiction is this idea of estrangement is not, uh, not possible under Maoist ideology. Um, the idea was that Maoism was the best possible of all possible worlds. And yeah, <laughs> the best possible of all possible worlds. And to even imagine a dystopia was to admit that there was the possibility for life outside of Maoist ideology. So, we don't have time today to really get into the Maoist scientistic pushback against uh, Western science. But there was, I mean, there was a repudiation of things like Einstein. They didn't believe in the laws of relativity, like officially, because it posited the potential for worlds or existences outside of the one that we lived and know. So this quotidian utopia was one that was being built in the present through present tools to create a future that was already assured under Maoism. Um, there wasn't a possibility for divergence. We were locked in to that utopian future and you just had to take these steps to get there. Okay, I, I hope I did not make the mistake of talking about social realism because I was really referring to socialist realism and, and there is this huge issue because it was supposed to be obligatory for any writer in, in the 
um, um, communist countries. So I, I think you should look into whether uh, it was functioning in the Chinese context and how it was functioning in this Chinese context. Because from my point of view, this would be the uh, really a, a perfect example for socialist realism, and according I think to the definition. That that most that people looked. who study these, and there are very few, but most people who study these texts would also agree with that. Um, they would categorize them as socialist realist literature. So there was a question there. Where is the mic? Okay. So I have two things to say. Firstly, we have a contribution from a fan. David King wants to say that Virginia Conn is brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> and the second one is a question to Victor. Uh, you, your presentation outlined a paradox in which the laws of robotics can never really be exhausted on the one hand, but on the other hand, we really need them to be such. So how, what, what do you think could be a resolution of this problem? What could be a solution to this paradox? Is there anything from our experience, for example, that can, that can help solve this? Why are you asking me this? Presentation <laughs> 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 outlined this paradox. I'm not educated enough to answer that question, I'm afraid. No, seriously. It's a good question, though. Okay, well, maybe if someone else wants to open the discussion. No, I can just recommend a book about that. Okay. <laughs> so, so, it's not really about robotics, but Neil Bodstrom, in his book on superintelligence, actually provides a very elaborate argument that we need to set up some rules before we make the superintelligence, because once we make it, it's already done and we are probably doomed. Uh, <laughs> that's his idea. Uh, so, uh, if I understood correctly, you should look into the book, but the idea is to set the proper goals for the superintelligence and to build it in it from the very inception. And how these goals should be formulated, you will see in the book, but the, that's the general idea to provide um, foolproof, uh, but very broad goals to artificial intelligence, and then when it evolves and develops, it will still be at least safe for humanity. Intelligence, Neil Bostrom. More questions?